Amen. Uh, may that definitely be our prayer this morning as we open up the Word. We spend some time with the Lord this morning uh, through, through His truth. Let it be our prayer um, that uh, Jesus is, man, He's what we want. Uh, he's the one thing that we're looking for. Uh, he's the one thing that we are desiring. I think, uh, I think Asa is definitely desiring it uh, this morning, which is awesome. Uh, <laughs> Hey, if you have your Bible, I would invite you to open to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we started a series last week, we'll continue today, uh, looking at some things that existed in the early church and then asking ourselves a simple question as we walk through some scripture, is this missing from our own lives? As we look to uh, the, man, just the work of the Holy Spirit, as we look to what Jesus did um, as he started his church in the beginning of Acts, the things that they saw happen, why can't we uh, see them happen? Is it because there are some things that they were doing, some things that they had, some things that they were receiving that maybe for us, as we just think about our own lives, we'd say this is missing uh, from us. And so Acts chapter 2 We're going to jump into verse 42 here in just a few minutes. And as you're flipping there and looking for that, I want to uh, just ask you a question. How many people in the room would say that you like to play with fire? Anybody out there like that? Uh, And maybe not just play with it, but you just think it's cool, right? Like fire is just kind of this this mystery. It's just amazing what it can do, the power that it has. Like fire um, is just cool. Well, I'm one of those people. I like fire. Um, as a matter of fact, as a, as a kid growing up, I spent most of my early years living in trailers, mobile homes. Anybody else? You lived in a mobile home, a trailer? You with me? Okay, wow. I'm by myself. All right, good. Well, in case you don't know what they are, they kind of look like a rectangular box with like metal on the outside. But when you open the doors, it's like a house in there. You're like, hey, this is cool. I mean, it may have wheels, but that's all right. All right. So for me, I spent my early years growing up living in mobile homes. Now, there may be a reason for this. My grandpa owned a business when I was a kid where he moved mobile homes for a living. In fact, he had a really original name for it. His name was Louis Boudreaux, and he moved mobile homes. And so here's what he named his business, Louis Boudreaux Mobile Home Movers. So props to you. Uh, Papa, we called him Papa Cooney. Uh, props to you, Papa Cooney. Uh, you were extremely creative. Now I know where I get my creative side from. I appreciate that. But anyway, uh, growing up in, in, in trailers most of our life, you know that there are some interesting dynamics that exist, such as you could pretty much crawl underneath your house and kind of dig around for things as you look directly above your head. I don't know if you experienced that as a kid, but this was something that was very real for me. We would crawl under the trailer, we would hide there, uh, we would pull insulation out, we would make our parents absolutely crazy, uh, we, would, we would drive them, them nuts, right? And so this is pretty much the story of my childhood. Many things revolve around what happened at the trailer stays at the trailer. And so this is just kind of my story. And so when I was a kid, I was actually probably, you know, early teenage years, I remember one day in particular, uh, me and a buddy that was staying with me at, at the house, at the trailer, uh, we got pretty bored that day. And so typically when teenage boys get bored, this doesn't end well. And so that's the case with what you're about to hear. And so we're bored, and so for some reason we had this idea that if we would just find a lighter and some of my mom's hairspray, that if we would spray that on the lighter, we would have like a flamethrower, right? Anybody ever done that before? I may be giving away all this I need to be rethinking this. Parents, maybe. All right, I, I don't know. Anyway, can you cover their ears for just a second so they don't hear? the Anyway, uh, and so me and my buddy, we found mom's hairspray, which was one of those, like, I don't know if you relate to this, you know, maybe more ladies than guys, although I'm not hating on guys who use hairspray. That's fine. If I had the hair that some of you had, I would use hairspray too, but it's steadily running away from my face. But anyway, nonetheless, my mom had one of those 30% more hairspray cans. Is hairspray cans just continuously getting a percentage more every year? Is anybody noticing that? 30% more, 40% more, 50% more hairspray, right? And so anyway, we had one of those 30% more hairspray cans, and we had a lighter, and we found a box in the yard, and man, we're just torching that thing. Like we are flamethrowing that box until there is hardly anything left. Now, my mom, who's the good mom that she is, notices that she hasn't seen us or heard from us, and so that can't be good. And so she opens up the door and she hollers my name, and me and my buddy instantly know we can't let her know what we're doing, right? And so here's our thought. We stomp out the box and we kick it under the house 
so that mom can't see the box. I know, I know you're with me, right? So here's what happens. Here's what happens. We kick the box under the trailer. We jump on our bikes because we don't necessarily want to see mom and her figure out that we've got our hairspray because maybe even more than us flamethrowing the box, we're using her 30% more right now, okay? So that can't be good. And so we throw all that stuff down, kick the box under the trailer, we hop on our bikes, and we go riding around the neighborhood, which was another just normal kind of day for us growing up. It wasn't long after we'd been riding around the neighborhood a little bit that I look up and see smoke in the distance. It's not long that we're heading back toward the house that fire trucks and emergency medical people begin passing us on our bicycles. And I remember thinking to my friend, man, something is on fire. And as we're getting closer and closer to home, here's what's processing through my brain. Wait a second. That's pretty close to my house. And then as we get even closer, wait a second. That's in our neighborhood. And then as we pull up on our bikes, wait a second. That's our house that's on fire. And so listen, man, I I roll up on my, I don't know what kind of bike it was. I roll up in my yard. Mom is furious, okay? The back end of the trailer where we kicked that box at, which, by the way, is my mother's bedroom, is on fire. Gosh, I hope she's not watching this morning. I don't know if she ever really found out what that came from. (laughs) All right, nothing yet. But listen, I learned something that day. It's a very simple truth, but it's still, it's still true today. I learned all it takes is a little spark. All it takes is a little spark. And you say, Danny, why are you telling us that ridiculous story? Well, here's why. There's a point to it, I promise. There's a point to the madness. I didn't think it then, neither did mom. But right now, mom, this is the point to the madness. The early church knew this principle way better than maybe we know it. Because listen, when the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of their lives, a fire was started that could never go out. You say, Danny, what are you talking about? Well, in the beginning of Acts chapter 2, let me read you a couple of verses. It says this, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they, they were all together, talking about the disciples, in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, what other tongues were they speaking? Were they just babbling into nonsense? No, no, no. Here's what it says in verse 11 of Acts chapter 2. It says, This is the testimony of the people who are there. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And so here's what's happening. The Holy Spirit falls upon this place where the disciples are meeting and praying and seeking out God. And before they know it, all these people who don't even speak these languages are preaching the name of Jesus to all who could hear in their own native tongues, even though they couldn't speak those tongues. Why? Because the Spirit can do things in us that we could never do apart from Him. And then look, I want you to see what happens. Peter stands up and he begins to preach about Jesus. And here's what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Listen to it. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now listen to you. I I, I don't know about you, but I want to see thousands of people set on fire for Jesus. Anybody? Amen? Amen. Thousands of people set on fire for Jesus. Well, what was happening in the life of the church that was inviting such a move of God? Well, here's what I want to do. Just for the next few minutes, if you'll go with me, I want to show you a few sparks that started a fire of a revolution that is still happening today. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to forget it. So Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 42, let me show you what's happening in the lives of this early church. Here's what it says. Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse, I mean, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. Sorry if I said chapter 4 18 times this morning. I didn't mean it. 
And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, I want to go rapid pace, so stay with me, right? I know I've heard from some of you. I talk fast. I'm a little overly passionate. I get a little sweaty. Listen, I know all of those things, all right? I've lived with myself for the past 34 years, so I know me better than you do, I promise. But here's what I want you to catch. If you will listen fast, I'm going to keep talking fast. Can we do that? All right, just bear with me. If you're a note taker, by the way, here's what I would tell you to put down. Here's the very first spark that I want you to see that the early church experienced that started a fire of a revolution that has never been put out. Now listen, as we look at these sparks, I want you to be asking yourself a couple of questions. Is this in me? Is this my life? Is this what I am also devoted to, the same things that the early church was devoted to? Because listen, I'm going to give you a little sneak peek. If it's not, then maybe there's something missing. Spark number one, you ready? Here it is. Devoted followers know that scripture is their standard. If you're a note taker, write that down. Scripture is my standard. This is what they knew. You say, Danny, how did they know it? Well, back in verse 42, it says, and they devoted themselves. Look at the very first thing they devoted themselves to, the apostles' teaching. Now, I do want you to notice something. As this begins, it doesn't say that all the super believers devoted themselves to these things. It doesn't say all the super Christians, all the pastors, all the ministers. No, no, no. Every disciple that was gathered together, it just uses the word they. Everyone who follows Jesus should be devoted to this. This is the first one. Scripture is their standard. Now, for them, it appears in the form of the apostles' teaching. Now, you say, Danny, why would you compare this to Scripture? Well, I don't know if you know this about this time, but they're not sitting here and the, and the letters of the, the book of Acts are being pinned as they're living these things out. They don't have the Bible like we have the Bible today. You know what they have? They have Old Testament scriptures. They have the life and the testimony of Jesus Christ. They have the personal witness of what these apostles went through, of all that Jesus commanded to them. As the Great Commission says, they are now charged to teach those to other people. They are now charged to present that as a way for people to obedient to be obedient to what God wants from them. The apostles' teaching for them has been magnified for us today where every single one of us, in whatever translation we could possibly imagine, with whatever device we want to pull out, can look at these words thousands of thousands of different ways and have access to the very things that God wants from us every single day. As a matter of fact, I saw a meme not too long ago that just made me giggle. The meme was a guy holding up a poster board. You may have seen this somewhere. He was holding up a poster board, and here's what it said. He said, while all of you are arguing about the right translation, none of you are reading any of them. Ouch, right? Like as we think about what is it, Jesus, that you desire of me? What is it, God, that will, that will launch the church forward? What is it, God, that will, that will create a revolution that could never be stopped? Well, listen to me. Listen. It's so basic, but it's so true. You ready? Spend time in the Word. This is where they found themselves. Day in, day out, meeting together, doing what? Spending time in in the word. Listen, the first disciples knew something that we have got to make sure is wrapped up in our brains that we can't get away from. Here's what they knew. They knew that in life they would not get very far without Jesus' teachings, without the Bible. And here's what we've got to know. In our culture, in the day that we live in, and the things that God desires from us, we can never do it apart from his truth, inspired by the, by the, by the spirit of God to 
empower us to live in ways that we could never live before. Listen, we will never get far without God's words. I love how the psalmist put it in Psalm chapter 14, verse 2, when he wrote, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, any who seek after God. Listen, he's looking for those who are devoted to him. He's looking for those who are seeking after him, who are desiring to understand, who are wanting him to guide their steps. He's looking for those who seek him out as they study his word daily. I don't know about you, but every question you have for life, every problem that arises, every doubt that comes your way, every temptation that the devil will throw at you from before to now to the future can all be combined batted with one thing. Listen to me. It's right here, and we have so many copies of it. It's called the Word of God. If it's that important, don't you think we should spend some time with it? I heard it said like this one time, the world is like a poisonous disease that we have breathed in and continue to breathe in every single day. The only way for us to survive is to inject ourselves with an antidote. The antidote for us is God's word. There is death and poison around us all day long, and the only way to keep that from infecting us is through the word of God. This is why we teach it several different ways every, all, all throughout every single week. We know the importance of the word. We want to pour it into every life that we could possibly pour it into. This is why there are scripture readings that you can see for every day. This is why your church is challenging you to stay in the word, have a personal time with God, meaningful moments in the scripture. Why? You can't do this life apart from the truth that he has so freely offered printed out, leather bound for us that we can look at any moment that we want. In fact, listen, I truly believe the way the early church lived was because they studied what Jesus taught. They studied the word. I wonder, this is a, this is a serious question for me, I wonder if we would begin to live as Jesus desires if we knew, in fact, what he desires. We can't do what he wants if we don't know what he wants. Let me show you this. This is what we read, Acts chapter 2, verses 45 through 47. I want you to see them again. These are some actions that are, that are pouring out from their lives. I want you to see these. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now listen, I don't want you to miss this. They were characterized as people who were generous. Why? No one had to force them to be generous. No one had to force them to give out of their abundance. No one had to force them to love people the way God wanted them to love them. Why? They wanted to give because Jesus gave. They wanted to give because they knew what he taught, what he wanted, what he desired. They didn't have to be begged. They knew it. It was right here. Listen, they worshiped together. No one had to put on some huge celebration. No one had to put on some special event. No one had to beg them and plead with them to come to church and worship the Lord. Why? They knew what Jesus taught and lived, and they followed his example. Listen, they had favor with all people. Why? Because they treated people with love because Jesus told them and modeled for them what it looked like to love people. If we would simply study what God has told us, we too could live in a way that God desires for us to live. Listen, don't just do something because you think you should. Don't just do something because the world tells you to do it. Study the word. Make scripture your standard to live by. So let me just, let me give you this question. We'll move on. Are you devoted to spending time with God through reading his word? If you say, Danny, I'd have to dust the old Bible off. Danny, I, I, I'd pull up my Bible app, and it would be something on there from three years ago. It's the last time I've done anything in the Word. Listen, if that's you, well, let me go ahead and tell you something. There's something missing. We need His Word. Is Scripture the standard for your life? Let me show you spark number two. You ready? Here it is, spark number two. If you're a note taker, you got spark number one. Here's spark number two. Want to see a fire, a move of God 
What did that look like for the early church? Spark number two, devoted followers know that relationships are required. Relationships are required. Verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Now, fellowship is defined as a community of interests. In other words, the church is not you alone. It's a group. It's a community that wants Jesus like you want Jesus. I don't know how many of you were standing up this morning and you were singing this, this, this final song as we were worshiping together. And you're processing in your mind, Jesus, all we really want is you. Jesus, all we really want is you. You don't owe me anything. You, you don't have to do anything. You're not a, a, a genie that I'm begging for you to grant some wish for me. No, 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 Jesus, I should be falling on my face because you've given me what I never, ever deserved. Jesus, all I want is you. Well, listen to me. Here's what he would say. Here's what the early church would tell you. Find people who are like that and live life with them. Find people who want Jesus and live life life with them. Listen, the early church spent time with other believers in order to help each other grow. They challenged each other. They cared for each other. They held each other accountable. Listen to verse 44 of Acts chapter 2. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 46. And day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Listen, this is not one person, a superstar kind of show. This is a group of people loving each other and loving Jesus and pushing each other to do things that they could have never done by themselves. Listen, relationships are required. This is why John wrote this, 1 John 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. I love how the writer of Hebrews put it, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. He wrote, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Listen to me, church. The question is not, Should I be connected with a group of people? Should a group of people be connected to me? That's not the question. That's clear in Scripture. You were never meant to do life alone. Here's the question that you got to process in your mind. You ready? You need to process what is the group that I'm connected to and how is God asking me to serve there? How is God asking me to, as the writer of Hebrews put it, stir up one another to love and good works? Listen, when you start looking at these scriptures after verse 44, here's what you notice. You notice the word together a lot. They did life together. They worked together. They prayed together. They ate together. They gave together. They worshiped together. They were together. The question for us that we've got to process through is this. Are we investing in other people's lives and opening up so that they can invest in ours? Man, I've heard so many different times over and over again that, man, people don't get involved in a small group or go to a Sunday school class or whatever it is because they don't get anything out of it. You ever heard this excuse? I don't get anything out of my time in Sunday school or my time with my small group. Well, hopefully this isn't offensive, but that's the worst excuse I've ever heard in my life. You're not in a small group for what you can get, but for what you can give away. And when you start giving away, then you begin to get. Can I just, quick testimony. Mark will probably hate this as I'm looking at him right now. I'm in Sunday school this morning, all right? My first time in Sunday school here, okay? I may come pop in in one of your classes, by the way, so... Don't be intimidated. Sorry about that. I'm just hanging out. And so I'm in Sunday school this morning, and here's what happens. Before I know it, our class is circled up around another couple in the class, and we're praying for some really heavy things that they're dealing with. Listen, for a moment, I looked up. Sorry, class. I looked up and looked at every person's face in that group. Can I tell you this? So many people were crying. Why? They were hurting over what this family's hurting over. Man, it was beautiful. 
It was beautiful. Listen, listen, then we got done praying. We sat down. And listen, Mark went from Genesis to Revelation teaching the entire Bible in our Sunday school class this morning. Here's what I thought. If all of you could have just sat in there this morning, we could have just dismissed and went to lunch early. Can I tell you something? I don't know the people in that classroom. I know a few names. I can't tell you where they live. I can't tell you much about their families. I can't tell you much at all about who they are. But can I tell you something? I can tell you this. They love Jesus. And I love Jesus. And I will never get better in my walk with him apart from them. So you say, Danny, I don't really... I'm not really involved in anything. I don't really plug in. I'm not really a part. <laughs> well, here's, here's the formal invitation to you. What are you waiting for? Because Scripture is clear to us. Relationships are required. And the only way you can be transformed to where God wants you to be is if you'll rub shoulders with other people who will sharpen you like God desires for you to be sharpened. Listen, we got to move on. I went a long time there. I, I, I know I'm done. All right. I have a common phrase that I think about when I think about doing relationships with other people. And, and just the question for me is this, who's riding shotgun? Who's riding shotgun? Anybody do that in your car? Got your shotgun, right? Your kids or whatever fight over who's going to ride in the front seat. Well, listen, most of you know, I, I've, I've been in youth ministry for, for a little over 17 years before uh, God led us here. And so one of the major things to me driving for youth camps for years and years and years was whoever's in the front seat for me is extremely important. In other words, whoever's riding shotgun on the trip for me is, is really important. Here's why. First of all, they're the DJ for my trip. Like, they typically control the radio. They control what I hear. Okay, that's number one. Number two, they're also responsible to keep me awake, right? I don't want to fall asleep. They, if you ride shotgun with me on a trip, you cannot go to sleep in that chair. If you want to sleep, you get in the back somewhere because whoever's riding shotgun has got to keep me awake. Listen, they keep my eyes open. Third thing, listen, they would be the navigator for the trip. In other words, we got to make a turn, we got to make a stop, I got to know where I'm going. Listen, they make sure to steer me in the right direction. Well, listen, I can't think of a better way to think about the people that I want in my life. Who's riding shotgun in your life? Who's controlling what you hear? Who's controlling whether or not your eyes are open? Who's making sure you're being steered in the right direction? Listen, if you don't have these kind of relationships, listen to me. Something's missing. Spark number three. I'm going fast, I promise. Spark number three. Here it is. Devoted followers believe that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Man, I love that last song that the worship team did that Evan led. Man, I love it, love it, love it. Listen. Devoted followers believe that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Look back at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread. Now, I don't have enough time to go really in depth here, but I want you to know something about this text. I wish they were just talking about sharing a meal together. But that would really be included in fellowship. And I'll share a meal with any of you. That's pretty easy. But that's not what, that's not what Luke's trying to key us in on here. What he's trying to show us is that by using this phrase, breaking of bread, he's talking about the Lord's Supper. He's talking about how every day they would meet together, and in the context of a fellowship meal, right, where they're spending time with each other, loving on each other, encouraging each other, in the context of that, they take a second and they go, wait a minute. We can't forget the biggest reason why any of us are in this room. You say, Danny, what is it? It's that Jesus was broken so that they could be healed. It's that his blood was shed so that we could have new life. I want you to notice this because it's so crucial to us. For this early church, every day, they made sure that they observed the Lord's Supper. Now, was it particular about the Lord's Supper? I don't think so. You say, Danny, we don't observe the Lord's Supper every day, should we? That's not my argument here. Here's my argument. Every day... They found an opportunity to recenter their lives on what mattered most. You know what mattered most to them? Jesus. You know what they treasured above everything else? Jesus. 
You know what the focus was for the relationships they had? Jesus. You know what the focus was for the work that they had to do? Jesus. You know what the focus was when they got off of work? Jesus. You know what the focus was with their kids? Jesus. With their friends? Jesus. You seeing a trend here? Here was the focus for them. Jesus plus nothing equaled everything. Jesus was all they wanted. Hey, friend, can I ask you a question? Can you say that is true of you? Because if not, listen to me, maybe there's something missing. Let me show you the last spark. This is spark number four. Last one. Devoted followers know that their power is provided through prayer. Their power is provided through prayer. This is why Luke said, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Man, Scripture was their standard. And the fellowship, that relationships were required to the breaking of bread. Because, listen, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And then here it is, here it is, and the prayers. Why? Because their power was provided through prayer. Can you imagine them as their their new lives in Christ opened up new prayer opportunities? They could now go before the very throne of God with any request. They could speak directly to God and ask him for any of their needs. In fact, can you imagine them reflecting on these words of Jesus? Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Can I show you something? Listen, they knew their need for God and their dependence on him, and so their only response was prayer. Can you imagine the mission that Jesus put on them, the the purpose that they had, and all they could do was think about how he was gone, and if we're going to accomplish this, we can't do it in and of ourselves. We're dependent on something greater. We need Jesus. In fact, you may have heard this before. This This is a famous quote. Before Pentecost, They were told to pray and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. This is in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. It says they prayed for 10 days, and then Peter got up and preached for 10 minutes, and 3,000 people got saved. Now we pray for 10 minutes, preach for 10 days, and maybe three people get saved. Listen, we've become so good at what we do that we don't see the importance to pray and ask God to do what only he can do. We've become so accustomed to being dependent on ourselves and, 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 and taking care of everything ourselves and hoping that everything turns out okay that we forget that we can unlock the greatest power known to the universe that God is longing to hear from his children and react and respond to their prayers. Man, it is a sweet incense, aroma, to the nostrils of God for his saints to cry out to him. Man, I love how the early church responded. When someone was in need, they prayed. When someone was imprisoned, they prayed. When they met with important officials, they prayed. When they needed boldness to speak the truth, they prayed. Listen to me, church. Lack of prayer is always a sign that you have lost touch with how dependent you are on the Spirit of God. It should be like breathing to us. No one has to remind me to take a breath. I know without it, I cannot exist. Listen to me. Is this not true of us spiritually? Man, no one should have to beg me, plead with me, remind me that I need to spend time with God in prayer. Why? It is my very life source connection to the power that God longs to pour out through me. How useless would any of this equipment that you see on stage be if we never plugged any of it in? What if instead of plugging it in, we just said, hey, these are real beautiful. Let's stand up here and bang on them as hard as we can. That's awesome. But if they're never connected to the power source, what good are they? Is that not true of us, church? How many of us are living every day disconnected from the power that God longs to provide and flow through us? Let me show you this. I'm done. If we would be devoted to God through scripture, through relationships, through obedience, through prayer. Listen, we would begin to see some of the same changes in our lives that can only be described by a relationship with God. You say, Danny, what are they? Let me, let me share with you what they are just from the text that we read. You ready? Awe and amazement at the power of God. Care and growth through a community of believers. Overwhelming generosity, life of worship, joy unspeakable, attitude of praise, favor with all people, more people following Jesus. I don't know if you're here this morning and you would agree with me, but listen to me, church. I want this in my life. I want this. 
I don't think this was just for the early church. I don't think this was just a magical time. I don't think this was just the Disney World experience and we'll never get back there. I don't think that. I think God designed his church to always be like this. I believe he longs for us to desire this. I want God to use me to reach the world. I want him to create life in me that only he can. I want to live for him. I want to be a life on fire for Jesus. Listen to me, church. A small spark can start a big fire. Are you willing? Are you willing to let these sparks be a part of your life? Are you willing to reflect back and say, God, where am I with you? Man, is scripture important to me? Is prayer important to me? Is fellowship, relationships, is it important to me? It, it, Jesus, are you the, the, the treasure of my life? Listen, are you willing to devote yourself to God? Are you willing to fan the flames of God in your life through these small sparks that he desires from all of us? I don't know about you, but I want to decide right now today to allow God to start a fire in us. Now let me leave you with a couple of thoughts. Maybe the, the numbers, maybe the numbers that God's wanting to add today, maybe they're you. Maybe you're here this morning and you're sitting in one of these pews and, and you're hearing about all these people who have been added, all these people who have been added, all these people who have been added. Listen, maybe there are people in this room right now this morning that, that you are the number now. You are the next one that God wants to add. Maybe you'd say, Danny... What do I need to do to give my life to Jesus? Well, listen, this is the same question that some of the people asked in Acts chapter 2, right before we got to verse 42. In fact, it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, this is Peter preaching, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So there it is, Jesus above everything. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Maybe you're here this morning, you're cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the, the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen, maybe you're in here this morning, you're saying, Danny, what do I need to do well, listen. I think Peter is clear. The, the Luke is, is is purposeful in 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 writing what happened here. Because listen, right now this morning, you can turn from your sin. You can repent. Right now, you can trust Jesus with your life. You can be baptized into the family of God. Right now, you can follow him, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide you for the rest of your days. He will be in you to live through you. Listen, maybe you're here this morning to give your life to Jesus. We would love for you to do that. Hey, listen, maybe the numbers that Jesus wants to add this morning are through membership. Man, I've talked to so many different people saying, man, we're just, we're looking for a church home. Danny, we're not sure if this is it, but we're just searching. Listen, maybe this morning God's asking you to join this church. Only if God's asking you, we would invite you to do that this morning. But maybe you just need to repent as a believer and start getting in the word developing relationships for him, obeying through worship, and praying every day, asking him to do what only he can do. Listen, the fire that the early church saw came through the sparks of obedience. Will you, too, respond obediently to Jesus today?